Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're gonna cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the final day of Food Allergy Awareness Week, and welcome to the Eating at a Meeting Podcast Live. I am your host, Tracy Stuckrath, Eating at a Meeting, Thrive Meetings and Events. And all week long, we've been here with fabulous guests talking about different aspects of food allergies. Kristen Osborne was here on Monday, and then we had Ruth on Tuesday, and Amanda on Wednesday, and Kyle, I'm glad, and I've got Carolyn and you're my token male. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that I have you on here. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me as the anchor in this food allergy awareness relay this week. I I know it's been great. I mean, there's so many facets of, of food allergies and everybody, Kyle is, I've followed him for years and he is a food allergy like icon in the food allergy world, but he is a social entrepreneur who founded equal eats, which is a company that helps people travel safer with dietary restrictions. He's a food allergy educator. He performs allergy awareness assemblies. And all week long, he's been singing about food allergies to thousands of people all week. And he's uh, performed at over 900 schools globally, which is so awesome. So thank you, Kyle. My pleasure. It's a busy week for everybody, but uh, that's Food Allergy Awareness Week for you. It's a great time. It to is. There, raise awareness it is. And we deal with this every day. So it's a great, great time to share that. Okay. So actually, because of that last thing about the schools and you've been singing all week, do you, are you, you're not singing just to kids who have food allergies. You're singing to entire schools, teaching them about food allergies. Is that right? That's why I do what I do. It's, it's, it's trying to reach kids that have never received this message before, or maybe they received it through you know a television show or another way and it's really trying to help kids get the right information in an age appropriate way so when i talk to you know students that don't have food allergies it's really trying to help them understand what allergies are all about how they can help with not sharing food at school washing their mm-hmm. hands taking it seriously and overall just developing empathy for differences so i just wish when i was growing up the kids around me we're a little bit more empathetic about, you know, this thing that made me different. Cause you've got, you've had food allergies since you, you were two or known since two and there's shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts, mustard. And Oh, now I'm going to forget the fifth one. Uh, do we say peanuts? Yeah. Peanuts, egg. tree nuts, egg, egg, <laughs> peanuts, yeah. tree nuts, eggs, shellfish and mustard. Yeah. And you knew that since you were, your mom has known that since you were two and you as well, but yeah, it was before food allergies were kind of a thing. I, you know, it was the mid eighties, <laughs> mid eighties diagnosis. So a lot has changed since then. But I've had a few allergies come. I've had a few allergies go. But consistently, I've had life threatening allergies since mid eighties. Mid eighties. Wow! And then for everybody to know, your wife has celiac disease. I wasn't targeting a, a dietary restriction, but. Uh, we really found in the early stages that this connection, when we dined out, we both had this thing where uh, dining out was tricky and finding safe food was tricky and we both love travel. And we found that we both have each other's back through that. So it's, it's kind of been nice and we have this crazy setup in our kitchen to keep each other safe, but it works. Well, and that's good. And earlier in this week, we, we did talk about dating because it, it's kind of hard. I mean, when do you tell somebody that you have, oh, these food allergies and, and then what is their reaction going to be? Not just your potential anaphylactic reaction, but what's their ana- reaction going to be like, oh my gosh, I don't want to deal with that trouble. Right. Right. Yeah. And the sooner, the better. I always think get it out of the way with, right. and then they know, and then you're going to see how they react, whether it's no big deal. And I remember from back in the day when I, when I used to, to date, it wasn't so much partner it was a partner's family as well that was part of that equation too because 
There's the meet the family dinner, which is already awkward, right? And then when there's the allergies on top of it, I, mm-hmm. I remember one time I just really wish I told them in advance because I couldn't eat anything and it made it really awkward. I'm sure, yeah, because you, you're like, uh, thanks, but I, I can't eat that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to die. Be rude. Right. I want to put, put a nice impression out there, but right. I'm coming off the wrong way here. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to food out. I mean, not... We're, we're still talking about food allergies, but the way I pitched this and the way I want to talk about it is before you started, before it was called Equal Eats, it was called what? It was called Allergy Translation. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and explain that. Yeah. And essentially it was a business I started when I was at university as a, as a marketing project. And oh, wow. really, uh, it started because I, I had a really tough time when I was traveling, backpacking around in my early 20s. I remember being in Morocco and just realizing I didn't prepare for this at all. I, I, I don't speak Arabic. I can't read Arabic. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was just very difficult for me to eat anything safe and communicate. So being kind of the last minute guy I was, I wanted to create a service that you could at least have your allergies translated very quickly. So you could you get it on a trip, get it the night before. And, and that was allergy translation. And within the last couple of years, I went back to school, got a master's degree. And again, go, through going to university, restarted this business as Equal Eats with a lot of lessons learned of how we could do this even better. Okay, so that's where I, I'm like, what does it, what does the word Equal Eats mean? And I think I've told you this before. I'm like, I'm so mad that I didn't think of that name because I think I, I love the name. And it's about diversity and equity and inclusion, in, in my opinion. But tell the audience about where that came from, how you came to that name. Yeah, Equal Eats. <clears throat> and essentially, I think for everybody who has a food allergy, and at least most people I know, we've almost become conditioned to feel like a burden through mm-hmm. so many negative experiences, through dining out and through social issues and whatnot. And and that has become an issue of equality where you go to a restaurant and you don't feel... Um, that you're on the on an equal uh, dining field as everybody else. It's not a normal experience like everybody around you is having. So our goal is really to try to make it an inclusive environment to make you feel that you're not a burden, that you are totally normal, uh, even though you have a dietary restriction. And the uh, the other goal with the name is it's not just food allergy that that should have all the attention. My wife has celiac disease. I know people with different intolerances and special diets that they keep for medical reasons. It's very important. So essentially, we all deserve an equal seat at the table, regardless of the dietary restrictions. And and that's kind of been the bedrock of of the Equal Eats. Well, and that's how when I'm speaking to to meeting planners and, and caterers is that whether it's a food allergy, a different medical condition, a religious based practice, or a personal preference because of life's medical, well, I already said medical, but for lifestyle or environmental reasons, we all should be able to eat. Yeah. And, and enjoy food. And I think that's a big exactly. thing too, where it's a lot of people, I think in a lot of people in our community, it's a very complicated relationship with food because of trust and, and not enough information about what's, what you're putting in your mouth. And when you can get to that level where you have certainty, you can enjoy food like everybody else does. So that that's really a goal is trying to break down those barriers so we can just enjoy food and and everywhere across the world. That's that's so important. And and from the original rendition to now, you've got it in plastic cards, right? Size cards. This is not yeah. a size card, but cards that you yeah. showed earlier. Yep. And then you also have an app. We have an app. Yeah. So it, it, we're trying to marry the two two worlds of old school, new yeah. school. There, there you go. You get the app <laughs> and you can toggle through languages right on the app because not everyone has a wallet these days. Not mm-hmm. everyone is carrying plastic. So every almost everyone has a phone. So we're trying to at least cover our bases. Mm-hmm. But what research told us for years is how much people want a plastic card. And, and part of the reason is it's this professional credit card size card that you're giving in a food service setting that whoop, that speaks their language. It's being taken seriously. It's in their mm-hmm. language. And from just design testing, when we were using cards in restaurants and phones, often we'd find that they want to bring the card, the message to the chef in the kitchen. 
And not yeah. too many people want to give up the phone, uh, especially right. when you're in a foreign country versus the card. Yeah, take it, show it. So it has its advantages, but in a pinch, the phone is great as well, just to get the message out there. So in all of your research in doing that and designing it, what were your biggest ahas from the diner's perspective as well as the kitchen's perspective? Oh, we're out of sync. We're completely yeah. out of sync on a lot of the, uh, on what we want to communicate as diners and what they need to hear as food service staff. Communication. And, yeah. Right. And it, it all comes back to that. Like I, I always think people think allergies, they think peanuts, but the biggest cause, if you look at all the research and studies of allergic reactions is miscommunication. And it's all coming back to that transfer of information and what we tell someone like a teacher or a camp counselor is, is one thing. And sometimes that message goes into food service settings. So we found there was a big disconnect there where especially a lot of loaded messaging, which is if this is your style, if you want to say severity and make analogies to it's a loaded gun or something like this, that's not my uh -huh. style. But then in terms of food service staff, they don't need to necessarily hear what scale it is in your mind. They need to know what it is. Is it allergy? Is it intolerance? Is it celiac? And then what is it to? What are the allergens? And then that's empowering them with the information and they can use the system at that point. Because I think a lot of diners think we can kind of get into their system mm -hmm. and start to, to control it a bit. But if you're going to a good place, they should have it already in place. And, and yeah. And that's what that's what Carolyn and Jackie were saying on Thursday is like you have to have the systems in place so that you can you can manage it safely in the back of the house and in the front of the house. Exactly. And it's our job as a, as a diner to just disclose <clears throat> is to be right. transparent about what we've got and then they can be transparent about what they do. And we right. can then make that decision of do we feel comfortable or not? But it's a bit of a dance and we're still kind of a little bit awkward in it from both sides. Right. We're getting yeah. there. Well, and then in my world of meeting planning, you've got the meeting planner, me, asking you what your needs are, and it prints out on an Excel spreadsheet, and then I'm sending that to a convention services manager who's then sending that to the chef, right? And like two weeks ago, I had a group of 550 people, and we had 30 people with dietary restrictions, but I've worked an event that had 683 people. Wow. So that's that communication is key. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. You know, I, I would assume too, that I've been to, to meetings and conferences where people didn't disclose in advance and they show up expecting some type right. of on the fly solution, mm -hmm. for them, which is not fair for anybody. You, you have to follow your process as a diner. Right. So you can help them as a food service operator. Yeah. And so it, well, all right, I want to go back to the intolerance thing because a lot of the questions I get from meeting planners as well is, or and, and from chefs is like, well, how do I know what do is it a is it a want is it a need and how do I treat them and I'm like I say treat them the same way and do in, the, in your research are you are you finding that or do they want to I mean doing the safety aspect of in the back of the house I would say it would be the same. It, essentially, it, it should be in terms of how there's a lot of standardized things of how you right. store your ingredients and, and labeling right. the supply chain. Really, it, there might be some differences with cross-contamination, mm -hmm. cross-contact procedures in a kitchen. But ultimately, if you're flagging a meal as special dietary restriction, it, it sh to make your life simple, it should be a very standardized procedure where it's right. not going from this is this, this is this, this is for this restriction. Make right. your life easier across the board. Exactly. So tell us some, what can guests do to set themselves up for dining success besides using one of your cards? Well, hey, there's always <laughs> that, but whether you use a card or not, like there's, this is a tool, but essentially you need to communicate. And that is, that is rule number one and how you do it is, is really up to you, but it is important that you're getting it out there and you're being clear. And, and that's why like we, we put, put it on card. So it's a very clear message. But if you're doing this verbally, it's it's laying out what exactly you are allergic to. Try not to muddy the waters with wishy-washy language. Like I'm kind of this, I'm kind of that. Like just, it is say what it is, it is what it is. And and get, get to the point and just get that information out. And 
essentially, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that you might be talking with someone that doesn't have the right info. It might be the 16 year old server that you're dealing with and that's fine, but trying to get to the right person, whether you're telling them like, is you might want to let the manager know this or the chef, or can I speak to them directly? But I have some pretty severe allergies to, to let you know about, and then they can at least flag the process. Right. And have you, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten pushback from that, but you've also gotten really a lot of people to welcome that conversation. Oh, more and more. And I think it's power in numbers these days versus the early 90s when it was, oh, we've got a, someone with a food allergy here. What do we do? So I think they're used to it. It's, it's normalized because there's so many now with dietary restrictions. So it's very rare that I have any type of issue or pushback. If anything, I kind of need to use my gut where if I'm having the young server that I'm not feeling that they've they've got this, I need to be proactive and say, I would love to, to talk to the manager just to make sure because your yeah, yeah, yeah answer didn't give me the, the comfort that I need. Last week I was in California and I asked a question about a thing and it was guacamole. And I'm like, I want the guacamole. He's like, you can't have it. It has gluten in it. I'm like, and I, it was guacamole with yuza, which is a fruit. I'm like, can you, he goes, it's the yuza. And I'm like, Use is like a mandarin orange. Like what he's like, it's the sauce that we put in it. But I'm like, okay, that would have been a lot, that would have been a lot more clearer conversation than just saying it was the user, right? And 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 I think this raises a great point. Nobody wants to look like a fool. And everybody right. it's got very common that they want to have the answers for you because that's right. part of their job. But I think what food service staff need to realize is that we really just want transparency. Right. And we don't want you to have all the answers. We want you to look in the book of ingredients. We want yeah. you to double check. And you don't have to have every single ingredient memorized. No one can do that. Right. And, and that's when you start to run into trouble when someone says, yeah, I think, I think this should be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you really want to use your gut and, and make sure. Yeah. And I'm going to pull up a picture because there was another little cute bakery or whatever in the neighborhood. And... I liked, and it was all the menu items were written on the board and the chalkboard and whatever. But in the upper right hand corner, it said, if you have any other allergens, please let us know because not all of the ingredients are listed on this board and we want to share them with you. And I thought that was really great Fantastic. You know, because it, it opens up that conversation. I mean, and I noticed it and I'm hoping everybody else with food allergies notices it as well, but it is, I mean, that's opening that conversation. Absolutely. You got to get yeah. it out yeah. Exactly. When you sit down, they start when they're trained to ask you, does anybody at this table have a dietary restriction? Mm-hmm. You know, those type of methods just make it so much easier for a diner to disclose. And everyone's different in terms of their self-advocacy and confidence. Right. But when when you make it a little bit easier, it helps. But it's also a bit of Pandora's box because it brings out some of these other requests that might not be an allergy, might not be an intolerance, might just be a, right. very, a little bit confusing. So it's right. Exactly. And, and actually that's, I design my, I teach how to design registration systems for event planners, mm-hmm. like put it under, put it CDA, put ADA questions, Americans with Disabilities Act for people. Do you have, do you need mobility assistance? Do you need dining assistance? Do you need visually impaired assistance while you're at this event? And how can we help you? And then that's where you ask, do you have food allergies? Do you have celiac? Things like that. Cause it yeah. helps open that question up. Absolutely. Because what you don't want are people muddying the waters with dislikes, right? calling it something else. And then exactly. this waters it down for everybody. And yeah, and I, I, I don't know why they do that. Maybe they're embarrassed to say they're 40 years old and don't like, don't like a certain food. But it's really important that you're very clear. Right, exactly. So how can we as diners and people with food allergies, how can we influence change in the food service system? Well, one is rewarding places that we're a very loyal community, the place as well, we go back. But I think also just to, to verbally give them that feedback that this this was amazing and not just tip well, but tell them that, that mm-hmm. you really made a difference for making us feel welcome. Leaving reviews that are very pinpointed to why this was such a great place and why they go above and beyond. So I think just to give that feedback is important, but also I think for our community, it's really important that we're, we're proactive too for the places that aren't so great. And mm-hmm. it's one thing to complain. And I mm-hmm. think 
we 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 all have had eye rolls. We've all had bad experiences, and it's it is what it is. But how can we take that and make it positive? Is my question of how can we proactive and mobilize people to address some of the bigger system issues, whether it's uh, restaurants not having allergen information available, restaurants not being trained, and how can we mobilize as an eight percent of the population and and actually influence change? Yeah, well, there's a menu I grab. I went to have lunch with friends of mine a couple last month, and it was funny because it was it was in a brewery, which okay, breweries have yeast, which is gluten, right? All that, or they're making beer, but, and they had the little logo at the bottom GF and the only, the labeling, there was only like one thing on the menu that was gluten-free besides their sauces. So all of their sauces for their pulled pork were gluten-free, but none of the pork was labeled gluten-free. I'm like, so I can have the sauce, but I can't have anything else that you serve the sauce with. And I just like, what's the point in putting it on there? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I want to go back and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm just really curious about this and not in a complaining way. Just I'm curious if you're putting the labeling on here and I think the coleslaw was g- gluten-free. I mean, that was it. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, and, and like my, that's a great example of, of taking another step instead of right. just going back home and complaining on social media, but right. like, being part of a solution because maybe they're just inexperienced overall with mm-hmm. providing accommodations and more options. I know with my, my wife, we go to places where they have limited options and especially like they have some gluten-free things, but when it comes to pasta, like just to buy some gluten-free pasta and have it in house, she always provides some type of, you, you could, you know, very easily make more money by offering this at a very, very accessible way. So Providing some options, some ideas without coming down on them, but working with them it, it can go a long way. And have you, I mean, I'm curious too, with when doing your research and, and talking to the, the chefs and the restaurants and things, have you changed some of their minds in the way they approach this and asked and just asking questions? I, I think they become more sympathetic to, to the, the plight of, of people with food allergies, especially parents where like a good tasting meal isn't always primary to them. It is a mm-hmm. safe meal. And I think that was eye-opening to, to food service staff. They take so much pride in what they do, which is wonderful. And I love a good tasting meals next to the next, as much as the next person, but safety's first. And, and when you can kind of calm those fears and, and really address that, that route, mm-hmm. then people can let down their guard and really enjoy that food more. So I think yeah. this was eye-opening for them. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's really important. And I don't want a bland meal either, but sometimes that's all you get. And, Mm. but, but I think being proactive on that restaurant side too, or the culinary catering side or whatever is like, go ahead and, and spend some of your research time creating some meals that actually meet those needs and taste good so that it's not, it's a safe meal and it's tasty. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And another thing, we talked to people that did not have any type of like matrix or ingredient information sure. um, readily available, and and just when restaurants have that, it's almost a flag to customers that we want to engage with you right. in a conversation, even if it's. I think there was fears we can't keep it up to date all the time. So yeah, absolutely, there, you have to do some work on it. But just to have it opens up at least that dialogue starting point, And that's important. And I think it's important to know, too, and, and, and on the updating thing for for even us as consumers, I'm like, they change the labels, right? Or they change the ingredients sometimes because, and especially now with sourcing, like, how did they change it? And is that label updated? And so we, I'm sure you get label notifications. Hey, there's peanut allergy recall on this or whatever. But that is challenging, especially with restaurants and hotels that have thousands of pieces, different types of food coming in on a daily basis. But I guess if they, if they looked at those meals for the food allergic, let's just say the food allergic in general as a scratch kitchen kind of meal versus something that's prepackaged, that would make it a lot easier too. Absolutely. And you yeah. know, even when a menu says, um, <clears throat> Tell us, uh, please inform your server, like just little things like that might not 
guarantee like we have this, this, and this, but it at least gets that conversation going. And right. That's exactly. Important. And so traveling around the world and probably not so much the last two years, but what has been the biggest joy in using your cards or, and, and do you see it from the front of the house? Well, lots of help. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I think it's it's the it's the hospitality industry overall. And as Mm -hmm. a tourist, they want to be hospitable. They want to accommodate you. And when you're not clear, when you're not speaking their language and you're fumbling through a very serious message, it's stressful for everybody. And Mm -hmm. when I use the card, it's almost like a sense of relief where there is like, oh, one, it's almost like they think it's cool. Like this is accurate in our language versus like a Google translate. And, and then it's telling a really important message that they want to know. So right. it really facilitates a better conversation when, when traveling. Well, and I think, and just going to your history, if you look at the video on Kyle's website, equaleats.com, you'll see that it was trying to translate the word cashew. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they, the waiter didn't understand what that, what you were trying to say. Exactly. And with, with all of the different tree nuts out there, it's, it's, yeah. And I, it's easy to get lost in translation and that's exactly what happened. And I got a response of uh, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got this no problem. And, and I knew it too. Like my gut was saying they don't have it. And I very rarely do I go against my gut and that mm-hmm. instance, I, I just kind of like, okay, don't make a big deal about it. They've reassured you and it caused a really serious allergic reaction. And it was just, yeah, it was translation of one nut essentially. Wow. And I remember being in Brazil, speaking in Brazil a couple of years ago and talking to the gentleman who was in charge of the Olympics, the Rio Olympics for the mm-hmm. athletes village. Cool. And Brazil had just actually come out with their allergen labeling and they broke it down. Instead of saying tree nuts as a whole, they broke it down to every single nut. Like they listed it out because they didn't want it to be confused, which makes it a lot harder, but it also is a lot clearer at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. With our cards, we, we provide customized cards. So you can mm-hmm. choose from, oh my goodness, we have 550 allergens you can choose from. Oh my goodness. Wow. It's okay. massive and growing every week. So, but people design their cards differently and we mm-hmm. have, we try to, to give some education of what's best, but some people just prefer saying tree nuts. And for those that it is very specific, they know they can eat some and some they cannot, they will list out specific tree nuts. So it's very interesting. Every card is certainly different. That's that comes yeah. out of- Well, and I'm glad that they're personalized. That's That makes it fun too. Okay, so one question that I ask everybody, what does a safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage experience mean to you? I think it's one where everybody feels comfortable. And I think for anyone with a dietary restriction, comfortable is a hard, a hard target at times. So it's, it's really an experience where you feel safe. You feel the information has been provided to you that you need. You feel welcome and you feel fulfilled at the end of it. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's providing the comfort that gives you confidence to, to dine safely and well. And that, yeah, I mean, because it's, because, and then the sustainability aspect of it is that you're going to come back, right? Absolutely. It's when you've set that system up, it's mm-hmm. it's done. And then people will come back and they'll tell their friends and things will grow. And I always think the, the places that cater well to people with dietary restrictions need to be rewarded. It's not easy. It's a more, there are more steps, but it is doable. So Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. It needs to be sustainable in that um, it's a cycle of being rewarded for that work. Well, and a Facebook user here says that sounds performative to me, like labeling naturally gluten-free things. And yes, I mean, I want, and it's, it's confusing too, because when do you want do you want it to list it so that it's gluten free or do you want to list it that it contains gluten? I actually want it to do both. And I I, I don't want it to be the, the, the back of a, a box. Right. But I want to be able to know that you, you took the time actually on every single buffet item here or menu item to look at it, to make sure that it is one or the other and Absolutely. let me know. Yeah. 
Okay, so today is special because I have another guest that I want to pop in here. And her name, and I'm going to pull it, her name is Karen Palmer. Oops, where did I just go? Woohoo! Hi. Hi, Kyle. Hi. So Karen, <laughs> she is an, I, I'm like doing this on the fly, is an executive and leadership coach and the owner of Karen Palmer Coaching, but she's also the mom of a, she's a mom of a food allergic daughter. And Kyle, I, I wanted her to bring on, bring her on here with you too, because her daughter, what, she's a freshman, Karen, is that right? Just finished her freshman year. Yeah. Just finished her freshman year. So you haven't grown up with food allergies since you were two and you went to college, right? <laughs> yeah. What is that? It's transitioning and educating mom. You, you got to let your baby go and, and yeah. fend for herself. And then, but you also still want to be your mom. And, but there's these things that you want to instill in her. So, but it's also being an adult and managing those things too. Right. I mean, it's, it's a huge adjustment for the entire family, right? I mean, it's, I grew up as a foodie. I loved eating everything, traveling everywhere, no limits. And I was faced when, you know, our daughter was 13 months old with the knowledge that she was allergic to six of the top eight allergens at wow. that time. And so it required a huge step back in terms of us really thinking through what does it mean? to be able to eat in a way. I, I loved what you just said, Kyle. I caught the back you know, portion of your conversation. The idea that a safe meal is more important than the most fabulous meal of your lifetime, because in the end, it doesn't matter how good it is if it endangers your life. And so for us, it was a huge adjustment to how do we make food safe within not just our home, but hopefully a wider environment so that our daughter could go out and live the kind of fulfilled life we wanted for her but that she would learn how to do that independently because as a parent at some point you just got to open the door and let them fly and they have to be able to manage for themselves I, I think that's so important and kyle as a person who educates students and i'm sure you're doing it more to elementary schools than to college kids singing teaching <laughs> them that well, the public <laughs> yeah okay, okay yeah yeah, but it's 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 instilling it instilling it when they're younger so that they do have that confidence. But it's also you got to hold on. But you, you, what are those things that you have to teach your kids to do and advocate for themselves when they're going to college? Because yeah. and I would just want to say too that college is nece not necessarily were the best at doing this in the first place. And we can talk about the Leslie University thing later on. But Essentially, it's it's tough, but I think you, you got to party proof your your teen well in advance, and and be prepared to chaperone on the sidelines because when they're young, you're very actively involved in, in managing their food allergies, and then it's a, a gradual shifting of responsibilities where you can't do everything for them, but you need to guide them to be asking about food at a restaurant and checking their own ingredients and. And making sure that they're carrying their epinephrine, but gradually you're not carrying it for them and you're not having to remind them as well. So when they get to the point where they're leaving the nest, you have to have a, that type of confidence that they can do it by themselves. But as I said before, chaperoning from the sidelines, because I think when you reach that age, when you're a freshman, you want to be independent. But are you fully independent yet? Some are, some aren't. So you really need to kind of keep tabs just Check in. How are you doing? Are you telling your roommate? Are you telling uh, your friends to have a plan in place if a party gets out of control with food and all of this? So staying involved is really important as you're kind of navigating this new transition. Yeah, that is so important. I mean, I think the baseline message here is that there needs to be a, a support network created that your child can then take and build on for themselves in the same way that we would say to our kids, by the way, if you're at a party and somebody's had a little bit too much to drink and they're the ones who are supposed mm -hmm. to be driving you home, what are you going to do about that? And you have to have those same kinds of conversations about you feel a reaction coming on in advance. You want to know that your roommate knows how to help you with self-injecting if they need to, that your RA knows that the specific information you need to keep yourself safe if the worst possible thing happens. Yeah. Well, and it reminds me of, well, let's go back to this few years, of this meeting planner in Canada that I met years ago. And she was telling her story. She di got diagnosed with celiac, but she had five emergency room visits in the year after being diagnosed with celiac. And she was allergic to tree nuts. 
at the same time. So wow. which eating gluten-free, you're using a lot of tree nut flowers, right? But now she always makes sure that she has a buddy when she has an event, right? And I think we have to rely on, and in it, it could be the meeting planner, it could be whatever. But I think when you're going to college too, Karen, you just said, is it your roommate? Is it your RA, somebody like that, right? That does have your back. Because I think it's really important to make sure that you have that. The, the biggest thing, I mean, when people say, what's the most important thing you can do to prepare your child to be successful at navigating that transition to dining independently, it's that that process starts long before you start looking at colleges, right? I mean, in middle school, this is when kids start to have the issue of self-carrying their epinephrine auto injectors. And this is also the age where kids are trying to figure out who am I and my friends are more important than my parents and I don't really want to do what my parents are telling me to do. And so there are all these complicated emotional factors that figure into how do I keep myself safe as I start to be out in the community by myself, hanging with friends, being in places where food is a big part of whatever conversation you're having. And so the biggest thing that I can offer to parents is that you need to start supporting and training your kids to be independent and safely independent around food really long before you get to the point of choosing a college. And that means making sure that they know how to carry and use their epinephrine auto injectors correctly, that they actually know and start asking the questions. Resist that impulse that when you go to the restaurant together, that you talk to the waiter for them. Make them do it. Because when they get to the point where it's automatic, they won't be as likely to forget. But it has to be second nature. I think having a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old talk to the waiter saying, hey, I have food allergies. While you, while mom and dad are sitting there, I think that to me would say to a wait, waiter or waitress, hey, this kid knows who they are, right? And they're not relying on mom and dad, but mom and dad are there to back them up at the same time. But I think that would be even more empowering to me as the kid, right? It really shows that they own it at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speak for themselves, right? And I think the other thing, I mean, because again, we know that it's often difficult for kids to do this within a group of their own peers. If they have the practice of doing it with you as backup, Number one, it cues the healthcare professionals, as you just said, and you know the, the folks who are supervising this dining experience, that this is somebody who understands their body. But it also means that they get over that awkwardness, at least in one situation before they have to start doing it in front of their friends, which is going to be harder for them. Right. Exactly. So how do you, Karen, how, what is the most important things? I mean, you may have just said it, but preparing them early, but important thing that families can do to prepare their kids to go to college and dine safely. Cause there's a lot of food, there's fraternity parties and sorority parties and dining halls and, and whether your university requires you to eat on the campus, re eat the dining plan. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is, I think the most important thing, the idea that they are as comfortable as they can possibly be with being their own best advocate. Your voice is always going to be the voice that controls how well the experience goes, you have to use it. But in addition, we touched on this before, the idea that you need to create your own network around you of people who know what your situation is. People can help you if you have a reaction and it progresses very quickly and you need support and being able to self-administer your auto injector, somebody who can help you call 911, whatever it is, that everyone around you needs to be aware of you know, the situation you might be in and how they can best support you. And that includes the dining service professionals that you start interacting with. I mean, mm -hmm. my daughter's allergist gave her a great piece of advice when she started looking at schools and she wanted to know, like, what should I be thinking about when I think about where I want to go to school? And he said, think about going where you want to go, but find out the information that you want along the way. And when you commit to a school, the first call you need to make is to the university's Office of Disabilities which supports students who have any kind of disability condition. And it's important for families to realize food allergy is a recognized disability because it does limit one or more of your core life activities. So that's the first call you make once you accept because you want them to know you may need special accommodations. 
that's where you can have certain questions answered. Am I required to have a meal plan? How are you going to be prepared to accommodate and work with? Because we understand the food service folks, they have to have to serve thousands of people every day. And mm-hmm. not everyone is as well educated as we would like. So the onus is always on the student, who, by the way, at this point is likely to be over 18 and a legal adult. It's always going to be on the student to be the person who does the lead advocacy. And as Kyle pointed out, we as parents and support can be there in the background, but the Office of Disabilities wants to hear from your student. The executive chef, the general manager in the dining hall wants to hear from your student. They don't really want to work through you as the parent because you're not going to be there. That's such a good point. I mean, you want the independence. And so here we're giving you that independence and you have, this is your first step in kind of owning it outside of living at home, right? Yeah. 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 Kyle, did you learn anything? I mean, or go ahead, Karen. No, no, I just said I was curious. Kyle, I don't know what your experience was, but I think that the biggest thing is getting over that fear of that that there's something wrong with me. And I don't want to have to expose that to strangers. And it's called this is this is the core of your life. There's nothing wrong with you. This is a health condition you have that has to be actively managed and you need support in doing that. Yeah. And and as you said, Karen, I think those years well leading to, to college are just vital to, to build that confidence of, of kids. So when they get to that point, it's not like this flicking a switch, like good luck out mm-hmm. there. Because I think this the college years are really identif- where you, you form your identity as an adult. You, you, you are making your own independent decisions of who you are, who you want to be, who you want to hang out with. And it's an influential time where you could be influenced even on how you manage your food allergies. And I, I just remember for myself, it was you know a, a completely new social circle, very different, and it influenced me on being more of a risk taker than I had previously been as a teenager. And for me, I, I paid the consequences through having a really severe reaction by trying to be cool. And it, it was essentially just not being grounded enough in my own self-management and confidence with my allergies that led to it that I, one risk led to another because it was college and you try new things, right? So I'd say those years leading up to it and, and then guiding as well throughout the college years is really important for all parents. That's, I mean, cause, and you, you then you throw in alcohol and, and all of that stuff too, right? That adds a whole nother level of it as well. And it, it is because you, you want to figure out where you want to go and maybe your your degree is going to change over the course of four years, but your food allergies are not right. No, there's they're with you, right? You, but you're you don't need to know what you, the rest of your life is planned out when you graduate from college. But you do need to accept for the fact that you have to manage these food allergies. No, yeah, and that's that's why the preparation is so important. It's first, as we've just discussed, preparing yourself in terms of attitude and your need to be your own best, fullest advocate, but then also reaching out to people and getting information that's going to support this transition for you. Like you call the disabilities office, connect with them, figure out what kind of accommodations would be most appropriate for you. Do you need a medical single? Is the allergy severe enough that you don't feel you can trust dining services and you might want to be able to cook for yourself? Not all colleges can necessarily accommodate that. And Right. That is something for people to keep in mind that accommodations mean different things based on where you're going to school and how the school is set up. So it behooves you to do that homework in advance. Things that we started thinking about from hearing from other families with college students, think about where's the closest hospital? Do the ambulances that serve that area carry epinephrine on board in case yours runs out before you get safe harbor? Are there places where you can buy safe food nearby if you want to prepare a meal or you need to pick something up? Safe food means different things for everybody. Sometimes it means having a supermarket nearby or you're fortunate enough to be able to eat at a particular fast food place that observes protocols that work for you. But knowing that sometimes you may need options beyond what the dining hall can offer because maybe the dining hall closed early one day or you slept too late to get breakfast. So it's really about looking at your entire environment and thinking, here's what I have set up at home. How can I create a safe environment that you know mimics as much of what I have at home when I go away to school? I love that, Karen. It it totally reminds me of a meeting planner going on a site visit and choosing a property for their event and including asking about the EMTs because 
not all, even though 36 states allow to have epinephrine on property, majority of the hotels out there aren't going to have it, but does an EMT have it? Not all EMTs are allowed to carry it, right? Or administer it. So asking where that hospital is, what the, but how, how do we create that inclusive experience? Can this hotel do this for the people who we are bringing in that have different dietary restrictions? Yeah, this is, I mean, I love that you brought that up because the inclusivity is something that, again, we have learned by experience not to expect because not everybody understands the nature of food allergy. And frankly, not everyone is supportive. Food allergy is an invisible disability. And so if you're looking at someone who looks, you know, 100% healthy, young, fabulous, and they're not presenting to you in a way that implies that they're in crisis, You may not get the immediate help that you need unless you are very clear about advocating for it. My daughter had an anaphylactic reaction, again, not through an on-campus dining service, but from an off-campus restaurant and noted it, self-administered, called, had appropriate support around her. But then when she got to the ambulance, the guys didn't want to transport her because she looked fine. And she had to basically get up in their faces and say, I know the law. I know what you're required to do. I'm having a health event and you need to take me to the hospital because I need to be observed. And eventually she got there, but she had to be the ones to tell them, this is how this is supposed to go. There are stories I've heard from other families where again, many ERs, when they know that someone's coming in and they need that support, they want to administer Benadryl first. And the bottom line is Benadryl does not stop a systemic reaction. All it does is mask the symptoms. So your child needs to know hey, I know what the procedure is. I need to epi first, epi fast. I need to stop this reaction in my body so that I can be safe. But they may be the ones that have to advocate for that to happen. And so when I talk about preparing kids so that it's literally in their DNA that they know what to do, you never know when you're going to be called to do it. Right, exactly. And, oh, that story just blows my mind. Your daughter Um, sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, You know what? We've had a great village and (laughs) I I cannot stress this enough. I think about Kyle, the population that you're serving, which is largely kids in the the K-12 environment. And for us, I remember the early days of looking for a preschool and this is New York City. I mean, where you practically have to have your kids go through interviews to find a spot (laughs) in preschool. But we had to give up on several places right away because we said, what's your plan for supporting kids with food allergies? My kid has a food allergy action plan. And their plan was, well, the school nurse is here on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I said, oh, so that's not really a plan because if my kid has an anaphylactic reaction on Thursday, we're in trouble. When we eventually found a place, it was that the director said to us, our plan is we take your plan and we discuss it with you and we figure out how do we best support your child. And we want you to educate us because we know we don't know a lot. So we know how fortunate we were. And I think, again, this is 20 years later. I think people are far more sophisticated than they once were about what food allergies mean in a classroom context, because what is it? One out of every 13 kids now Mm -hmm. has a food allergy. So if you've got a class with 26 kids in it, it's likely that two of them are going to have a food allergy. It really is that idea that the village is necessary. We had supportive friends. We had supportive family. We used the services of a food allergy counselor when my daughter was making that transition to self-caring and dealing with all of the complicated feelings that come with now being the different one in my social group. And I would totally recommend that if people are seeing that they need additional support, that they find a food allergy counselor in their area. And there's a wonderful website called foodallergycounselor.com run by Tamara Hubbard, who is a a licensed therapist. We haven't had the pleasure of meeting, but I have referred people to her site when they needed outside support. Because a lot of times there are people who have family members who aren't particularly Mm -hmm. supportive. Maybe you have an auntie who's really attached to the favorite dish that she makes for Thanksgiving. And you as the 13-year-old don't feel comfortable going to her and saying, auntie, could you not make that so I can come to Thanksgiving dinner? Right. So sometimes we need support that's outside the family that allows the kid who's growing up to feel like I have a place to put all my stuff on the table. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So I, I know Kyle, you have a hard depart right now, right? I so, love <laughs> and he, he's like seven hours ahead of us in, oh, in Europe. Wow. So it is, um, thank you so much for being here. And 
Thank you for doing what you do. And everybody, I'm posting his website here, Equal Eats. You can find his app and his cards there and on social media and all of those platforms, right? Same Absolutely. Thing. I'm around. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much for being you here. Take care. All right. Nice to see you. You all too. Right. Bye. Bye. Okay. I know a lot um, of people who use Kyle's cards. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they are. And the fact that he translates it into more than 30 different countries or languages <sighs> is, is mind blowing. And, it's hugely and, important because again, we live in a world where people mm-hmm. travel and this is the other thing. We don't want our kids to feel like I have to have a limited life. I have to have a limited perspective because I'm managing a health condition. Yes, it's right. serious. It's potentially life threatening, but the bottom line is they deserve to have the fullest life possible. And we have so many more tools now to allow them to do it. Yes. You know, very, things very like true. that are a huge, huge support. Exactly. And, and just think that your daughter would be as a sophomore or junior going off and doing a study abroad. I mean, those cards would be a huge benefit for her wherever she chooses to go. Right. She's already had the experience of, again, as a middle schooler going on a class trip to Spain, a prospect Mm -hmm. that terrified my husband and I, because we'd never had her away for more than, you know, like (laughs) a couple of nights and then to be overseas in a place Mm -hmm. where, you know, again, no opportunity for us to be pleasant. And every single meal was eaten in a restaurant or at a hotel. And the thing that was amazing about that experience, because again, Mm -hmm. we activated the village. Her teachers were all aware. Her closest friends knew how to support her if was necessary. But the thing about being in Europe at that point, she said, mom, all the menus were marked. I was able to talk to people about what my needs were. She said it was easier to eat there at that point than it was to eat here in her own community at home, which well, and that's, was a little sad. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. And that, everybody, if you don't know, it was the EU 1169, which I mentioned on, I think, Thursday or Monday or both, which requires all, they require just like here in the U.S. that packaged food be labeled, yeah. but it requires, in 2014, this was instituted, that all unpackaged food, even the food at a quick trip gas station has to have you have, they have to be able to provide the allergen information about the food, which I think mm-hmm. is awesome. Now, yeah. it, it's, I think it's hard for people, again, who don't have to manage this kind of health condition to understand how profoundly it impacts daily life. I mean, there is no casual interaction with food. My daughter has never looked at any particular food she encountered as necessarily being safe. Because even if you've eaten something at the same restaurant or eaten the same brand more than once, many times, there's no guarantee that the next time you eat it, it will be safe because Mm -hmm. there's always the possibility of cross contact in a restaurant or a food service kitchen. Manufacturers in this country are not required to label for allergens. It's a voluntary program, which we hope Mm -hmm. through advocacy will change. But again, they have to have a completely different perspective about how they interact with food, which governs almost every aspect of interaction with people. A hundred percent. And then I mentioned going abroad, but, you know, getting an internship or working in and getting hired somewhere, that's a whole nother interaction as well. Going because you're, you're 18 or even when you're 16, right? Getting, you're getting your first job and whether it's in a fast food. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, true. Yeah. Camp counselors or working in a fast food joint. Right. Yeah. And We, I think that that's really, really important. There was one question that we were talking about before the show, but it's like, what's one thing that people might not think to consider when going to college? And was that the EMT thing or was that I mean, something there were a couple totally of things. Yeah. The EMT thing for one, I mean, again, because I think we make the assumption that ambulances carry everything that we might need for any kind of medical emergency. Right. And that's just not true. So forewarned is forearmed. And this is why you want to have two sets of auto injectors with you all the time, because sometimes the ambulance doesn't get there quickly and you need to be prepared if you need a second dose to be able to go and you know administer right. again for yourself. But things like thinking about food outside the cafeteria, like college, friends want to be able to socialize off campus from time to time. Have you checked out restaurants in the area? Have you actually spoken to people who work there so that you have a degree of comfort that these are people who would actually understand what my needs might be. Is mm-hmm. there a supermarket close to the campus? So again, if all dining options are off and you, need, you just need to grab something quick that you might be able to eat so you're not hungry all night, or if you need to be on campus during a time when the dining halls are closed, that you right. have options in terms of things to eat. So 
it's really about trying to figure out, does this environment have what I need to exist, not just on a regular day-to-day basis, but if anything deviates from the norm? Right. And I don't know why this just popped into my head, but with COVID, that and in food insecurity as well, and, and our friend Emily Brown and the yes. Food Equality Initiative, I mean, there's not a lot of food pantries out there that serve individuals that have food allergies and dietary restrictions. And I know that there's some stats from colleges that a a large percentage of students are food insecure. And that's a whole nother level of that. We didn't even bring into this conversation until I just thought about it, even pre-talk about it. But I mean, that's a whole nother aspect to think about too. It's why it is important to have this conversation start early. I was privileged enough to conduct a panel on dining with food allergies, which is on the web at Food Equality Initiative's YouTube channel. And I encourage people who want to learn more about college dining to go look that up and find it because we spoke to Amelia Smith and Caroline Molassese from FACT, which is the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team, a wonderful support organization for all things food allergy and anaphylaxis. They have an amazing college resource center also on the FACT web, which is foodallergyawareness.org. Mm-hmm. Caroline put that together. It, it you know answers so many questions that parents might have and that students might have about how to create the support network you want. But really to hear these folks talk about this in the video that, that FEI put up, it's that personal you know, touch because there are all kinds of things you often don't think to ask. And mm-hmm. one of the people who participated in that discussion is a recent college graduate who was able to share her personal experience, which really opened our eyes to some of the things that often we don't as the adults think about. It's super important if your student has the opportunity to connect with other uh, students who've you know, gone through this process. Mm-hmm. And so if you can find a support group through FACT or another food allergy advocacy organization, recommend that. Really, knowledge is power. And this is a situation right. where, you know, as much knowledge as that's going to position you to be the most successful with the experience. Well, and I love that because, and then through FAIR as well, there's the allergy support groups around the country. I know mm-hmm. they're for a lot of moms, but those moms in those cities could be good supports for those kids if you need them. No. I, I mean, believe, you know, both with, fact and fair run yeah. team mm-hmm. retreats exactly. so that there are opportunities for folks yep. to you know, get together and meet in person uh, right. and have a different level of comfort and frankly, ability to attend those things now because those involve right. spending money. But you right. can find resources online through those organizations now in a way that you couldn't when mm-hmm. we were at the beginning of our process. And I am really heartened by the fact that there is so much more information out there for students and their families right. now to make this a successful experience. Sorry if that came out. I was trying to find that video and it went in my ear. Um, <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want it to play. I just want to find it and post it. Well, and that's, and and, and I know there's Snack Safely that's got a list of colleges as well. Yes. I mean, and so there are those resources out there and it is definitely not that a medical person, the, the school disability office probably can't give the names of students without their permission, but they can say, hey, let's put this this group together. And I think that's a great idea because yeah. you want them, school, you're trying to c- convince this kid to come to your school and that would be a really good way to convince them, right? Well, I think if the they have the good do, great resources. Is that again, you know, you're right, they can't just volunteer information, but right. some schools, students, the opportunity to go on a roommate matching right. board or service where mm-hmm. you can say, here's what I'm looking for in a roommate. And you might be able to say, I have a food allergy. I'd love to be matched with someone who has the same allergy or at least a, a knowledge and a willingness to work yeah. with me mm-hmm. in terms of personal space, especially if you want to be assigned to a unit that has a kitchen and maybe they don't have singles with access to kitchens. Maybe it has to be a, a group experience. But being able to do that in advance is a huge thing. So again, the Office of Disabilities can't be the thing that does it all for you. They're the legal right. place where your information resides, but they are not going to advocate for you directly in the way that you need to do for yourself. And so you need to talk to them, but then you need to start building your own network of support. So what was the what was the biggest challenge with you and your daughter? In, in doing this transition, I mean, was there a challenge or in oh, sure. and saying, okay, you <laughs> with any teenager, Shutting right? up and letting her drive. That was the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> you 
because <laughs> it's easy to say as a parent, yeah, I'm going to let you handle this. I mm-hmm. trust you. And I did trust her. I mean, my daughter has never known a world where food was completely safe. She had her first anaphylactic reaction at 13 months. And so I did not, I was just always in a place, my husband was always in a place where we had to be, as Kyle put it, that support from the sidelines. But in order for your child to be successful with this experience, you have to be willing to step back and say, all right, my role is to follow up, to check in, to make sure you're doing what you need to do. Did you call the Mm -hmm. Office of Disabilities? Did you get the paperwork? Have you found out what's going on as far as the roommate search? You want to go to this restaurant? Did you call ahead? It's a fine line when you have an adult level child and you don't want to be a nag, but you also want to make sure that at a time when their focus is going to be on making new friends and having new experiences, that they're supporting themselves in the safest way possible to do that well. And one thing I know I've forgotten here that is super critical is you as a parent, may still be paying their health insurance because we all know they can still Mm -hmm. be on your insurance till 26. Most kids are not paying independently for insurance. There are legal papers that you need to fill out in advance of them enrolling in college. So for example, if they end up in the hospital as a result of an anaphylactic reaction and they're over 18, you don't have any right to their information. information. Signed. Those are the initials. I cannot remember um, exactly what they stand for, but it allows you to basically be part of their universe of information so that the hospital can contact mm-hmm. you and can share. You also need to have them sign a healthcare power of attorney and um, you know, a durable power of attorney in the event that you know they are not able to advocate for themselves and that you need to step in and be that full legal support. So three things. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's huge. Got to get it done before they go. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's we don't think about it because we're used to thinking about them as our kids, right? Right. Your yeah. kid is a legal adult, mm-hmm. and as a result, you no longer have access to their information. And right. the college or university cannot help you unless you have put all of that into place. Well, and my aunt, on a, I was dealing with that with my cousin, who is like forty five years old and hadn't had surgery and it was mm-hmm. bad, but Ooh, but he didn't have any of that in place, right? So yeah. She's advocate. It, it took some time. So, oh my gosh, Karen, that is huge. Thank you for saying that. I mean, because yeah. you don't think about that. And even if you are an adult and married, right, you need to make sure that, and, and you're going on a business trip. Does your company know who your emergency contact is and event planners? Are you asking who is that emergency contact? Because if I have any, any attendee, you should have that information for, right? No. Especially in the day and age, but food allergic person or a diabetic person, what information do you have so that you can let their, their family members know that they're in the hospital for that reason? Right. Absolutely. I mean, again, I, I can't say it enough. Knowledge is power. Information is power. Right. Are, are they still wearing their medical alerts, mm-hmm. IDs or whatever brand you use? you still need to have some form of indication on your person because again, there's no guarantee that if something happens that you're going to be on your campus or with someone that who knows you to be able to tell people who you are. So 95% of healthcare responders are going to look for a bracelet or a necklace or something that might give them information about whatever health condition you have. And so as a food allergic person of any age, you're doing yourself a favor by making that information easily accessible for any healthcare provider who might need to assist you. Ah, oh, that is just brilliant. I mean, I, it's, it's such a thing that you don't think about and, and it, and we, we probably all never thought about it in general, right? So you have to make sure that you've got that. It's just that extra step. And especially in, in important when you're, they're still on your insurance. No, I yeah. mean, One thing I do want to stress, because I think, again, this is so much information and immediately a lot of folks, we go to the worst case scenario because we're afraid of letting go and, you know, it's letting our kids go off and and do all this stuff. But we are in, I can't say this enough either, a much better universe than we were 20 years ago. I mean, we've had legal steps in direction that, again, support the idea that food allergy is a legally recognized disability. It can be accommodated. There have been legal decisions like the Leslie University settlement that said universities actually do need to modify meal plans to accommodate people with food allergies. At Ryder University, they had a settlement that said the university itself must be responsible for making those accommodations. You can't rely on a third-party outside vendor 
to do that. So you can't blame the vendor if something went wrong. The university is responsible for that. And I believe there was a settlement at one of the SUNY schools that says, if you are, again, your medical team, if you decided that your allergic condition is severe enough, that a medical single room needs to be provided at no additional cost. So again, you're going to have to pay for it, whatever the single would cost. But the bottom line is you can't be upcharged right. for your medical condition. And so there are advances that have been made. Are they as much as we would like? Are they fully supported? No. Mm-hmm. But they're off than we were. And people are pushing for improvements every day. And, and I'm glad that you brought up those other two because it is... The, the the Leslie University case was the biggest one, the very f- forefront of that. And and it required it said that the students had to eat on campus for the dining meals and right. but they weren't making accommodations. And so the students went to the Justice Department and that was a huge turning point. And and I do like the fact that um, you said the writer universities like mm-hmm. the university itself is not they have to make sure that it's being adhered to even though they are hiring a third party company to, to serve the food and beverage, they have to put the standards down and say, this is what we want. And that to me, that actually is huge for workplace environments. Like, Hey, you're, you're hiring this company to come in and feed your, your employees. You have to have the same standards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. you don't want to be in a place where you feel like somebody's going to pass the buck if something happens. I mean, right. We all understand as food allergy families and people who work with food allergies that there is no guarantee of safety under any conditions because cross-contact can be as random as the restaurant doesn't serve items with nuts in them, but somebody had a granola bar on their break and forgot to wash their hands before they picked up someone's order to bring it into the dining room. The weapons that we have to fight against food allergy, which there's no cure for at this point, are education and constant vigilance. And if we employ both of those, we can also get to the third place, which is understanding and support from our community. That's awesome. Okay, so to wrap this up, the question that I ask everybody is, what <laughs> does a safe, sustainable, and inclusive dining food food and beverage experience mean to you? And you could put it in the context of college mm. universities or just in general. Well, I think in general, I mean, because this applies just as much in in the universe that you work in of the larger food service community, is it's an experience where everyone who is involved has the information they need to make the dining experience as safe and enjoyable as possible. So that means the diner has information that allows them to choose whether or not this is an environment where I can eat safely. And where the kitchen staff and anyone who is involved in handling and preparing the food has the information they know in order to make sure that they can prepare food in a way that is not going to expose diners to risk. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it it is. And it goes back to that statement that you reiterated from Kyle. It's like we want to just we want to be safe. And in the end is like we don't want to die and we don't want to go to the hospital. Right. And. And, and we do. So I think somebody said it the other day. It's like, we don't, ex- we don't expect this big, huge hoopla, right, of a meal. We just want to make sure that we've got something to eat. Yeah. I think something that in, yeah, I'm sure you've encountered this in, in food service, something that I think is really, it, it makes the light bulb go off for a lot of people is I've said to folks, if you offer a safe experience, a, a friendly, welcome experience, to people with food allergies, they will become the most loyal customers you have Mm -hmm. ever had. They will tell everybody where they've been. They will encourage you to go. This is a market segment that I think that people from a business perspective really have not exploited for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes, it is more of a challenge. You have to think a little harder about what to do it, but there are plenty of people who are doing it successfully and folks who are interested can do a little research and find where are the restaurants that have made this a cornerstone of what they do, where the food service environments who are really successful. And there are a number of them who are functioning in places like college campuses. Everyone is not equally successful. And again, that message to your new students, when you're in the line and you see somebody using the same spatula to flip your supposed hamburger and they stick it under a cheeseburger on another grill, that's something Mm -hmm. where you have to be able to go to the manager on duty and say, hey, 
I just saw something that actually could make me sick. Can we talk about this and can steps be taken to make sure mm-hmm. it doesn't happen again? Yep. So it's really about education because we can't assume that the person who is the line cook is going to know what the executive mm-hmm. chef or the general manager in any facility knows. Anytime you see something like they say here in New York about the subways, you got to say something. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being mm-hmm. here. I'm so excited to have you. And, oh, thank you, and, and you're welcome to be the final guest on Food Allergy Awareness Week. It's been a really educational week and <laughs> with with so many different things to think about and and it's just it's it's what you just said. It's it's education and awareness and we all we all have to eat and we all want to eat safely. Yeah. So no, I thank you so much for the invitation. I think it's great that you have this whole week to focus and to introduce people who may not know a lot about the situation our families face, but really also to help build that spirit of community for a health condition that is not well understood, I think, by the general public and often not supported in the way that we would like to see it. So anytime we can build potential allies and raise consciousness, that's some place that I know both of us want to be. So thanks to everybody exactly. who's listening today. Yes, thank everybody who's listening today and, and all week long. And these videos are on the Thrive YouTube channel, the Thrive Facebook page. They will be on the Thrive website as well. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for wanting to create safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences. But until next time, everybody stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Thank you. You all enjoy your weekend. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrat, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.